Chapters 14 to 21 of Einhardt's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Einhardt's Life of Charlemagne, Chapters 14 to 21. 14. The Danish War. The Saxon war next came to an end as successful as the struggle had been long. The Bohemian War, 805 to 806, and the Linonian War, 808, that next broke out, could not last long. Both were quickly carried through under the leadership of the younger Charles. The last of these wars was the one declared against the Northmen called Danes. They began their career as pirates, but afterwards took to laying waste the coasts of Gaul and Germany with their large fleet. Their King Godfred was so puffed with vain aspirations that he counted on gaining empire over all Germany, and looked upon Saxony and Frisia as his provinces. He had already subdued his neighbours the Abodriti, and made them tributary and boasted that he would shortly appear with a great army before Aix la chapelle Arkham, Charlemagne's capital, where the king held his court. Some faith was put in his words, empty as they sound, and it is supposed that he would have attempted something of the sort if he had not been prevented by a premature death. He was murdered, in 810, by one of his own bodyguard, and so ended at once his life and the war that he had begun. 15. The Extent of Charlemagne's Conquests Such are the wars, most skilfully planned and successfully fought, which this most powerful king waged during the forty-seven years of his reign. He so largely increased the Frank kingdom, which was already great and strong when he received it at his father's hands, that more than double its former territory was added to it. The authority of the Franks was formerly confined to that part of Gaul included between the Rhine and the Loire, the ocean and the Balearic Sea, to that part of Germany which is inhabited by the so-called eastern Franks, and is bounded by Saxony and the Danube, the Rhine and the Zala. This stream separates the Thuringians from the Sorabians, and to the country of the Alemanni and Bavarians. By the wars above mentioned he first made tributary Aquitania, Gascony, and the whole of the region of the Pyrenees as far as the river Ebro, which rises in the land of the Navarres, flows through the most fertile districts of Spain, and empties into the Balearic Sea, beneath the walls of the city of Tortosa. He next reduced and made tributary all Italy from Aosta to Lower Calabria, where the boundary line runs between the Beneventans and the Greeks, a territory more than a thousand miles long, then Saxony, which constitutes no small part of Germany, and is reckoned to be twice as wide as the country inhabited by the Franks, while about equal to it in length. In addition, both Pannonias, Dacia beyond the Danube, and Istria, Liburnia, and Dalmatia, except the cities on the coast, which he left to the Greek emperor for friendship's sake, and because of the treaty that he had made with him. In fine, he vanquished and made tributary all the wild and barbarous tribes dwelling in Germany between the Rhine and the Vistula, the Ocean and the Danube all of which speak very much the same language, but differ widely from one another in customs and dress. The chief among them are the Welatabians, the Sorabians, the Abudriti, and the Bohemians, and he had to make war upon these, but the rest, by far the larger number, submitted to him of their own accord. 16. Foreign Relations He added to the glory of his reign, by gaining the good will of several kings and nations. So close, indeed, was the alliance that he contracted with Alfonso the second, 791-842, king of Galicia and Asturias, that the latter, when sending letters or ambassadors to Charles, invariably styled himself his man. His munificence won the kings of the Scots also to pay such deference to his wishes, that they never gave him any other title than Lord, 
or themselves than subjects and slaves. There are letters from them extant in which these feelings in his regard are expressed. His relations with Aaron, i.e. Harun al-Rashid, 786-809, king of the Persians, who ruled over almost the whole of the East, India excepted, were so friendly that this prince preferred his favour to that of all the kings and potentates of the earth, and considered that to him alone marks of honour and munificence were due. Accordingly, when the ambassadors sent by Charles to visit the most holy sepulchre and place of resurrection of our Lord and Saviour, presented themselves before him with gifts, and made known their master's wishes, he not only granted what was asked, but gave possession of that holy and blessed spot. When they returned, he dispatched his ambassadors with them, and sent magnificent gifts, besides stuffs, perfumes, and other rich products of eastern lands. A few years before this, Charles had asked him for an elephant, and he sent the only one that he had. The emperors of Constantinople, Nicephorus the first, 802-811, Michael the first, 811-813, and Leo the fifth, 813-820, made advances to Charles, and sought friendship and alliance with him by several embassies. And even when the Greeks suspected him of designing to wrest the empire from them, because of his assumption of the title emperor, they made a close alliance with him, that he might have no cause of offence. In fact, the power of the Franks was always viewed by the Greeks and Romans with a jealous eye, whence the Greek proverb, Have the Frank for your friend, but not for your neighbour. 17. Public Works This king, who showed himself so great in extending his empire and subduing foreign nations, and was constantly occupied with plans to that end, undertook also very many works calculated to adorn and benefit his kingdom, and brought several of them to completion. Among these, the most deserving of mention, are the Basilica of the Holy Mother of God at Aix la Chapelle built in the most admirable manner, and a bridge over the Rhine at Mayence, half a mile long, the breadth of the river at this point. This bridge was destroyed by fire, May 813, the year before Charles died, but owing to his death soon after could not be repaired, although he had intended to rebuild it in stone. He began two palaces of beautiful workmanship, one near his manor called Ingelheim, not far from Mayence, the other at Nimagen on the Val, the stream that washes the south side of the island of the Batavians. But, above all, sacred edifices were the object of his care throughout his whole kingdom, and whenever he found them falling to ruin from age, he commanded the priests and fathers who had charge of them to repair them, and made sure by commissioners that his instructions were obeyed. He also fitted out a fleet for the war with the Northmen. The vessels required for this purpose were built on the rivers that flow from Gaul and Germany into the northern ocean. Moreover, since the Northmen continually overran and laid waste the Gallic and German coasts, he caused watch and ward to be kept in all the harbours, and at the mouths of rivers large enough to admit the entrance of vessels, to prevent the enemy from disembarking and in the south, in Narbonensis and Septimania, and along the whole coast of Italy, as far as Rome, he took the same precautions against the Moors, who had recently begun their piratical practices. Hence Italy suffered no great harm in his time at the hands of the Moors, nor Gaul and Germany from the Northmen, save that the Moors got possession of the Etruscan town of Civita Vecchia by treachery, and sacked it and the Northmen harried some of the islands of Frisia off the German coast. 18. Private Life Thus did Charles defend and increase, as well as beautify, his kingdom, as is well known. And here let me express my admiration of his great qualities and his extraordinary constancy alike in good and evil fortune. I will now forthwith proceed to give the details of his private and family life. After his father's death, while sharing the kingdom with his brother, he bore his unfriendliness and jealousy most patiently, 
and, to the wonder of all, could not be provoked to be angry with him. Later he married a daughter of Desiderius, king of the Lombards, at the instance of his mother, but he repudiated her at the end of a year for some reason unknown, and married Hildegard, a woman of high birth, of Swabian origin. He had three sons by her, Charles, Pepin, and Louis, and as many daughters, Hrudred, Bertha, and Gisela. He had three other daughters besides these, Theoderada, Hildrud, and Ruadade, two by his third wife, Fastrada, a woman of East Frankish, that is to say of German origin, and the third by a concubine, whose name for the moment escapes me. At the death of Fastrada, in 794, he married Lutgard, an Alemannic woman, who bore him no children. After her death, June the 4th, 800, he had three concubines, Gerswinda, a Saxon by whom he had Adeltrud, Regina, who was the mother of Drogo and Hugh, and Ethelind, by whom he had Theodoric. Charles's mother, Berthrada, passed her old age with him in great honour. He entertained the greatest veneration for her, and there was never any disagreement between them, except when he divorced the daughter of King Desiderius, whom he had married to please her. She died soon after Hildegard, after living to three grandsons and as many granddaughters in her son's house, and he buried her with great pomp in the Basilica of Saint-Denis, where his father lay. He had an only sister, Gisela, who had consecrated herself to a religious life from girlhood, and he cherished as much affection for her as for his mother. She also died a few years before him in the nunnery where she passed her life. 19. Private life continued, Charles and the education of his children. The plan that he adopted for his children's education was, first of all, to have both boys and girls instructed in the liberal arts, to which he also turned his own attention. As soon as their years admitted, in accordance with the custom of the Franks, the boys had to learn horsemanship, and to practice war and the chase, and the girls to familiarize themselves with cloth-making, and to handle distaff and spindle, so that they might not grow indolent through idleness. And he fostered in them every virtuous sentiment. He only lost three of all his children before his death, two sons and one daughter, Charles, who was the eldest, Pepin, whom he had made king of Italy, and Hrudrud, his oldest daughter, whom he had betrothed to Constantine the sixth, 780-802, to Emperor of the Greeks. Pepin left one son, named Bernard, and five daughters, Adelaide, Atula, Guntrada, Berthade, and Theodorada. The king gave a striking proof of his fatherly affection at the time of Pepin's death, in 810. He appointed the grandson to succeed Pepin, and had the granddaughters brought up with his own daughters. When his sons and his daughters died, he was not so calm as might have been expected from his remarkably strong mind, for his affections were no less strong, and moved him to tears. Again, when he was told of the death of Hadrian, 796, the Roman pontiff, whom he had loved most of all his friends, he wept as much as if he had lost a brother or a very dear son. He was by nature most ready to contract friendships, and not only made friends easily, but clung to them persistently, and cherished most fondly those with whom he had formed such ties. He was so careful of the training of his sons and daughters that he never took his meals without them when he was at home, and never made a journey without them. His sons would ride at his side, and his daughters follow him, while a number of his bodyguard, detailed for their protection, brought up the rear. Strange to say, although they were very handsome women, and he loved them very dearly, he was never willing to marry any of them to a man of their own nation or to a foreigner, but kept them all at home until his death, saying that he could not dispense of their society. Hence, though otherwise happy, he experienced the malignity of fortune as far as they were concerned, yet he concealed his knowledge of the rumours current in regard to them, and of the suspicions entertained of their honour. 20. 
conspiracies against Charlemagne. By one of his concubines he had a son, handsome in face but hunchbacked, named Pepin, whom I omitted to mention in the list of his children. When Charles was at war with the Huns and was wintering in Bavaria, 792, this Pepin shammed sickness and plotted against his father in company with some of the leading Franks, who seduced him with vain promises of the royal authority. When his deceit was discovered and the conspirators were punished, his head was shaved, and he was suffered, in accordance with his wishes, to devote himself to a religious life in the monastery of Prum. A formidable conspiracy against Charles had previously been set on foot in Germany, but all the traitors were banished, some of them without mutilation, others after their eyes had been put out. Three of them only lost their lives. They drew their swords and resisted arrest and after killing several men were cut down because they could not be otherwise overpowered. It is supposed that the cruelty of Queen Fastrada was the primary cause of these plots, and they were both due to Charles's apparent acquiescence in his wife's cruel conduct, and deviation from the usual kindness and gentleness of his disposition. All the rest of his life he was regarded by everyone with the utmost love and affection, so much so that not the least accusation of unjust rigour was ever made against him. 21. Charlemagne's Treatment of Foreigners He liked foreigners, and was at great pains to take them under his protection. There were often so many of them, both in the palace and the kingdom, that they might reasonably have been considered a nuisance, but he, with his broad humanity, was very little disturbed by such annoyances because he felt himself compensated for these great inconveniences by the praises of his generosity and the reward of high renown. End of chapter 21